Good evening, everybody. So as we're welcoming people in, um, can I just show you that uh, we have translation instructions on the screen. Um, the first part of the webinar will be in Welsh. So if you need um, translation facilities, then please um, click on the interpretation um, bottom uh, interpretation button on the bottom of your screens. And then if you select English, um, you should be able um, to hear the So if you've clicked on English, you want to be able to hear the interpreter. Um, if you again, you just need to click um, off. Um, the second part of the webinar will be in English. Um, just to let you know. So if you can do that now. So if you've um, clicked on English, you want to be able to hear the interpreter. If you've clicked on English, you want to be able to hear the interpreter. Um, just to welcome everybody in um, and then we'll be ready to go. Thank you. Okay then, so I think we'll make a start. Um, so, Chris, so very warm welcome to you all to this webinar that looks at reducing the carbon footprint on your farm and how this is achieved by others. Reducing your farm's carbon footprint and how others are achieving it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have translation facilities available if you need to listen in um, English because the first part of the webinar will be in Welsh. Um, so, as you can see, the translation instructions are on the screen. Um, you need to click on the interpretation button and then select English. If you've clicked on English, you hear the interpreter. Um, you will then need to go back and turn and select off um, because the second part of the webinar will be in English. So, just to let you know as well, uh, we are recording this evening's webinar. So, just get a few pod, me with the Just to let you know that this evening's webinar will be recorded. That's just a point of information. So if anything pops up on screen, you just need to click on continue. If, you, if something comes up on your screen, you will need to click continue to carry on listening. So a very warm welcome to you to this evening's webinar. We will be having an overview of the carbon work that's going on on a number of our focus sites and our demonstration sites that exist within the Farming Connect Demonstration Farm Network. We will also be looking at some EIP project work that has been undertaken thus far. So in order to make a real start, I'll just take you through some of the services available from Farming Connect currently. So in terms of the advisory service that we have available currently, there's one-to-one -one advice funded to the tune of 80%, while group advice can be 100% funded. The application window is currently open. Uh, business advice can cover many topics, including business reviews, including financial planning, diversification projects, succession, and so forth. While the technical advice focuses more on soil analysis, on uh, guidance for working with livestock, for improving biodiversity, 
and also uh, some guidance on how to farm uh, in a more environmentally conducive way. Uh, and that's just to name a few topics that we are covering. Also, just to let you know that the skills application period is open currently. That application window open on May the 3rd. It'll close on June 25th. This means that there's up to 80% funding available for training courses for businesses and individuals who are registered with Farming Connect. Uh, there are more than 70 different courses available uh, on many different subjects, again, uh, under the categories of business, land, livestock, and so forth. Also, there's a network of training providers uh, who are dotted around Wales. Therefore, it's easy for people to attend courses uh, via the funding that's available for skills training. Also, just to let you know that we have a number of webinars that are up and coming in the near future. As you can see on screen, that's just a snapshot of a few of the ones uh, happening over the forthcoming few days. And specifically, uh, looking at the topic of red meat, we have a webinar on uh, parasite management in sheep on May the 18th, a webinar looking at tree health on the same day. And then on May 19th, we have a webinar that will look at uh, the project at Moylogan Vaur Llanroost using bolus technology in order to improve conception rates and to tighten up the calving period on that particular farm. So bearing in mind, if you want to register for any one of these, you're more than welcome to access the Farming Connect website, or alternatively, you can get in touch with your local development officer or your local technical officer. Also, just to give you a very quick overview of the Farming Connect development officers who are located in various places, Pan Wales, if you have any questions or inquiries about anything, whether that be um, advice or skills work, or, or as I mentioned, uh, anything in terms of attendance at webinars, you're more than welcome to get in touch with these individuals. So back to the start then and back to this evening's topic. First of all, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our first speaker, Professor Williams from Bangor University. You're more than welcome to ask questions as the webinar progresses and you can do so by typing your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll do our best to, to answer as many questions as possible. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand you over to Professor. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much, Gwaur. And thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I hope that everyone can hear everything well and that the interpretation is working for you. I'll just share my screen if I may. I take that you can see the screen fine. I'll just make the slide bigger. So as Gwaur mentioned in her introduction, the focus of this evening's webinar will be how we can reduce the carbon footprint on farms. As we'll see as the presentation progresses, there's a combination of methods. There isn't just the one silver bullet, the one thing that everyone can do tomorrow morning or next year or whenever. Uh, everyone starts from a different place and different methods apply to different farms. But one of the important things to remember this evening is that there is something that we can do on all farms and hopefully we'll just focus on a few of the options. So it's something that there's a lot of talk about currently, and uh, there's a lot of pressure on the sector and the industry to reduce our carbon footprint. But it's one thing to say it, the question really is how we do it. Now we know about the pressure, the increasing pressure that the sector is under the red meat sector and agriculture generally, in fact. And this pressure comes from consumers, customers of the industry, we must bear that in mind. As any other industry, we have to keep our customers and consumers happy and we must meet their demands and requirements. And I'm sure that a number of you are suppliers uh, of retailers or supermarkets, specific supermarkets, possibly you have a specific contract with a certain supermarket. Well, almost all, if not all, to be honest, of the main players uh, in terms of supermarkets, they publicly 
declare and make it very prominent what their targets are for working with their suppliers, which obviously in the food sector, it means working with the processors and also working with the farmers who produce the primary produce to essentially reduce the carbon footprint of the food that they sell. And obviously, we all know as one supermarket does something like this, it's a domino effect and the next supermarket wants to be even more visible in terms of the targets that they set for themselves and everything has really snowballed. And this is something that uh, we are seeing uh, in increasing numbers, more and more processors asking uh, and making certain demands is very visible in the dairy sector. If you look on the Tesco website, Waitrose, Max and Spencer, Sainsbury's or whoever, we will now see that they are doing uh, a lot uh, in terms of paying attention to this issue. And obviously, we know that the government also, well, uh, are talking about ways and means of reducing the uh, uh, amount of animal products that are consumed. Uh, there's talk of taxation on red meat uh, as a means, essentially, of reducing the consumption of red meat and in turn that they hope that that will reduce the carbon emissions associated with the production of that. We won't delve too deep into that uh, in this presentation and neither will I talk all that much about uh, the changes in policy but I'm sure that everyone who's tuned into this evening's webinar will be all too aware of uh, the way that things seem to be going in terms of Welsh Government. I'm sure that you uh, will have read uh, the consultation papers, all three of them, and we know that there is uh, an increased and sustained pressure on environmental considerations when it comes to agriculture. So where does that leave us in Wales then? Well, I don't think that doing nothing is not an option. It's not an option to sit idly by and do nothing. I think it's an agenda that's here to stay. Uh, people all of a sudden aren't going to just lose interest in this issue. Governments aren't going to let it fall by the wayside. Supermarkets all of a sudden aren't going to say, well, actually, we aren't concerned about carbon footprint. This is an issue that's here to stay. In terms of the red meat sector in Wales, I don't think that just carry on regardless uh, and hoping that uh, we, we can forget about it. I really don't think that it's a, a feasible option. We see um, campaigns such as this one uh, from Habiki Kemri, a document that's been given a lot of attention, the Welsh way. And the agricultural sector in Wales does portray itself as one of the world leaders in terms of uh, producing meat in a way that is sustainable and environmentally friendly. What we must remember also is that we've got to prove it because everyone else are playing the same game as well. Let's look at Ireland, for instance. If you look at Australia, New Zealand, ultimately every country pretty much um, of the main players in the game for the red meat sector, um, they uh, are all saying the same, are all preaching the same stories, if it were, in terms of how will they reduce carbon emissions and how it, they'll reduce their environmental impact, why they are more sustainable than anyone else, and so forth and so forth. So if we are serious in saying that we in Wales are global leaders in this, one, we have to prove it, and two, that means that we will have to be um, in, a situa in a position to up our game because everyone else is doing so. So that's the background of the context very quickly. Um, but I suppose you wouldn't have tuned in if you weren't aware of the context and uh, appreciate the importance of it all. Just one or two points then, because they are very relevant to the topic of discussion this evening. And I'm sure that most of you will be aware of it. When we look at the red meat sector, these are the three main greenhouse gases that we refer to. Carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide is the most important one globally. But in all honesty, from agriculture, um, carbon isn't that important. But the other two uh, are, are very important, which is methane and nitrous oxide. And these are two greenhouse gases that are very potent, very strong in terms of their impact. The, the methane is about 25 times stronger than carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide is almost 300 times more potent than carbon. So 
when we visit farms and we'll see how it's done momentarily when we visit farms and when we try to calculate the carbon footprint of farms what we do in all effect is we try to calculate how much of these three greenhouse gases are produced and then we turn all the values into what we call a carbon equivalent so because methane for instance is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide it has a carbon equivalent of 25 and because nitrous oxide is 300 times stronger uh, it has that value in terms of carbon equivalent or to put it another way if we have a system that produces a ton of methane it's the same as producing 25 tons of carbon. So it, it just turns that value to be what we refer to as the carbon equivalent, where we have just the one value uh, to calculate at the end. And from where do these three main greenhouse gases from? From in agricultural systems then, on your farms and in farms of Wales, well, carbon dioxide, uh, primarily from burning fossil fuels, so that's for heating the houses, it's about uh, the oil and so forth that we burn. Obviously, there's carbon being released when we use fertilizer. Uh, there's a lot of energy required to produce fertilizer. So a lot of carbon produced at that time. Methane, well, we've heard a lot about this issue. Ruminants cattle and sheep and so forth, they produce methane quite naturally. Uh, and that's the main source of methane. And then the third one, uh, the important one, the nitrous oxide, where does that come from? Well, every time we spread fertilizer or manure, whenever we put some nitrogen on the land, whether it be in slurry, FOM or artificial fertilizer, then some of this nitrogen is lost in the form of nitrous oxide. So it's soil bacteria that turns the nitrogen into nitrous oxide and some of it is lost. So that very, very briefly uh, is a description of the main three greenhouse gases and the sources where we find them on farm, or where we find the emissions on farms. I'm sure that you could all follow that. So if you are going to be undertaking a carbon footprinting activity, what happens? What does it mean? Well, think that this is your farm in this chart. And to all ends and purposes, what we do is we calculate all of the inputs over a period of a year, usually. So we'd calculate the amount of fertilizer that a person uses in a year, how much concentrate. We can look uh, at how much electricity is used and so forth. We can then calculate quite accurately how much greenhouse gases uh, are emitted from purchasing and using uh, the inputs to the farm. We then look at uh, the stock on the farm. We can estimate how much methane those animals do produce, how much nitrous oxide they produce um, through the nitrogen being applied to the land and so forth. And then we'd be in a position to calculate the emissions from all of those various sources of greenhouse gases. And we can put all of that together to get the carbon equivalent value. So we turn all those values uh, and add it up and we turn it into a carbon equivalent. And then on the other side, we look at the outputs from the farms. So in this case, it's a, it's a sheep farm. We look at how many kilograms of lamb are produced. We look at how many store lambs are produced. Are you selling breeding sheep and so forth? And to all ends and purposes, we are able to divide uh, the total amount of carbon that we've calculated in the first step, which is the result of the inputs, we can divide that with the outputs. So let's say that you have a farm that produces, make it simple, 10 tons of, of carbon per annum, and they produce 10 tons of lamb of meat, well, we divide 10 by 10 and we have a value of one. 
So that is essentially how we do it, and that is how we uh, calculate how many kilograms of carbon dioxide uh, that are emitted from one kilo of produce, be it a kilo of lamb, be it a litre of milk or whatever else. So essentially, that is how we calculate carbon footprint, or alternatively, we can divide the whole total as opposed to dividing it between what you produce and farm, we can divide it uh, with the number of acres or hectares that you farm to see uh, what is emitted for every hectare farmed. And there are two, there are two um, formats of doing this that are suitable and useful for various reasons. Both are very useful in their own right. And you also will have seen the picture of the tree on the left-hand side of my screen. So what we try to do also is when we calculate carbon footprint, we also try to estimate how much carbon is being sequestered annually on your farm. I mentioned that usually we look at a period of a year and we calculate how much carbon is produced and so forth over the course of that year because of the input, because of the livestock and so forth. Well, in the same way then, within the same year, we try to estimate how much carbon is being drawn in, therefore how much is being uh, sequestered. Sequestration is the English term. We try to calculate the sequestration, how much carbon is being sequestered over the course of the year. So what we're in position to do then is to take that value from that first value of what's emitted. So what's emitted, what's also sequestered and stored, and we take one from the other, and we have the net value. And I'm sure that you will have heard of net zero and that what it refers to. Um, how much is emitted and what is sequestered and are they balanced? That to all ends and purposes is what net zero means. And there's so much talk about it, but sometimes there isn't even an explanation of what it actually means. So that is how we measure carbon footprint to all ends and purposes. And the steps that I've outlined there quite briefly, uh, those are the steps. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a poultry farm, whether you're a dairy farm or a, a beef farm or, or whatever else, uh, those steps are essentially the same. Now, there's a number of different ways and a number of different tools that you can use for this purpose. And some of them uh, are more accurate than others. I think it's safe to say that some of these uh, you can do the calculation work within a matter of hours, in fact, and some of them uh, means that it, there's a lot more detail required, more work to be done. Well, it stands to reason where there's greater detail put into the system, we'll get more detail coming out of the system. So usually those tend to be more accurate, but it does mean more work. So people ask us, well, which is the best mechanism? Which is the best tool? There are dozens of them available, to be honest. It all depends. It, I don't think it's possible really to say that one is better than the other, because it depends what you want from the process. But since they calculate things in a slightly different way, comparing the value of one with the value uh, that's been calculated using a different tool, I don't think that's really possible because there are some things that aren't even included in some of the mechanisms. Um, so it is exceptionally important that we remember that. Now, there is funding available uh, via FarmConnect for you to be able to calculate your carbon footprint on, on your farm. And what you should have, and possibly Gwaur can say more about this at the end, what you should have would be an individual report for your farm telling you what your uh, carbon emissions are per hectare, per kilo, if you recall what I showed you earlier, the two ways of presenting the data. Ultimately, you should have an individual report for your farm, and that, in turn, will help you to target those specific areas where you can improve on. And we have done this with 20 farms recently, farms that uh, it's in cooperation with uh, Habiki Kemri, hill farm, upland farm, lowland farms, uh, mixed systems, uh, different type of systems and so forth. 
and I'm just going to give you a very, very brief outline of the results that we found. So we did this using the uh, tool that we have here at Bangor University that is detailed. Um, it, it can be quite an onerous task to fill in all the details. Uh, it all depends um, how well someone has kept records and so forth. So we worked with 20 farms, calculating all of the inputs, all of the outputs, looked at uh, how many hedgerows and so forth they had, how many trees they had on the land in order to calculate the sequestration. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we took one figure from the other to have that net value at the end, the net emissions, uh, as you find in the red font there. And quite quickly, this graph, uh, I'm just going to try to make one point from this graph, 11 graphs there from Hill Farms. And they, they were among the 20 farms. What I'm trying to demonstrate here is this, that there is a difference. And it can be quite a significant difference between farms to, to the naked eye are, are very similar. It's all to do with efficiency. And it's all to do with a number of other factors as well. So if you're in a group and your value is different, your, if your carbon footprint on your farm is different to the person next to you in the group, possibly it's higher or lower, don't dishearten, don't panic. It's perfectly, perfectly expected because there is a difference between farms. What's important is that you understand the difference so that we can all share good practice and that we can ask, well, what do you do there? And this is what I do here. And we look at the differences. Possibly it's something that you do when you benchmark financially, we all learn from one another. No one can be good at doing absolutely everything. There's always areas in which everyone can improve. So this then, and I don't expect you to be able to, to read all uh, the font in any great detail, but we calculated uh, what is responsible mainly uh, for, <coughs> for the emissions. The orange color that you say, that's methane. So emissions from animals are responsible for over half, essentially, uh, the emissions on farms as a rule. The gray area on the graph then, that's nitrous oxide that's from fertilizer and so forth. So if we can do something to reduce those two, um, I, I think that we can make a, a fair bit of headway in terms of uh, reducing the carbon emissions. In terms of electricity and so forth, if I'm honest with you, it's very, very little uh, in terms of its impact, the use of electricity on beef and sheep farms, because we don't use much electricity. If you're a poultry farm or if you're a dairy farm even, it's a different case, but on beef and sheep farm, on farms it's relatively small and the green part of uh, the pie chart uh, those are emissions from concentrates uh, those are relatively low if you're on a pig farm uh, you would expect it to be uh, a lot higher so it's wholly dependent on your system uh, but there are some common elements in there as well that we need to bear in mind and one of those would be the methane count now i'm not going to spend any time on this uh, but what this uh, what these charts show you uh, are the rates of sequestration. Uh, trees are important, soil is important, uh, but it can be difficult to calculate how much sequestration happens in soil. It's easier to calculate in terms of trees, if we're honest about it, uh, and it is an estimate. We can't be 100% sure in terms of our figures, but there's a lot of talk about planting trees on farms and so forth, and certainly, certainly the right tree in the right place has a role to play in reducing uh, net emissions. So how do we get to net zero? Uh, this is what the whole industry talks about. It's what Welsh government are talking about. Ultimately, the target for Welsh government by 2050, uh, NFU Cymru uh, are, are ambitious to do it by 2040. So how do we get to that point? There are two ways, quite simply, to reduce emissions in the first place, uh, and secondly, as opposed to try to sort the problem afterwards, let's reduce the problem or the causes uh, in the first instance. And secondly, the second approach to enhance the sequestration uh, so that we can offset any of our emissions on farms. So 
all the answers to the problem essentially uh, fall into one of these two categories. Uh, the options will vary between farms, but each and every farm can do something different, can make a contribution in terms of the first option. When you look at reducing emissions, uh, it's a matter of increasing efficiency. It's a matter of uh, ensuring that you take the right options. There are options uh, on screen there. Uh, the picture at the bottom uh, shows uh, a tractor with some cameras and sensors and all the different gadgets in cab. Now, I don't want anyone to think that all of the answers uh, lie in high tech because it's not necessarily the case. Very often, it's a matter of doing the basics right, and that's the first step. Robotics and drones and things, yes, they all have uh, uh, their part of the solution, but essentially, uh, they aren't actually as relevant for beef and sheep farmers here in Wales. You can see a number of different options on screen there, getting the right diet in place and so forth. And I'm sure that we can touch on a few of these uh, shortly. But what's important to bear in mind and to remember is that these make sense. Uh, and who doesn't want to be efficient? Uh, who in business doesn't want to be efficient? Uh, I mean, if the animals are healthy, uh, I'll use this as just one example. If the animals are healthy, they grow quicker and they'll get sold quicker. If they leave the farm uh, a month sooner, you've created a month worth less methane. If it's a month less concentrate to purchase, uh, it's a no-brainer, as the phrase goes. Um, obviously, it's not that easy or we'd all be doing it, but there's always scope for everyone to improve and to increase our efficiency. And the second option then is that we uh, increase sequestration. I know that there are uh, our other Farm Connect webinars that are looking at sequestration and it's vitally, vitally important that we take this seriously. Uh, we need to focus on the efficiency this evening. And just a handful of slides left then for me to take you through. We are working with Farm Connect and we collaborate on a number of focus sites specifically. Two farms, two focus sites and we are focusing on efficiency. We can see where they are currently, what their position is, and we'll work on some specific elements to see what the impact of uh, making some improvements would be on uh, carbon footprint. The first farm was Castellior on Anglesey. Delan, uh, if you're listening this evening, you'll know these cattle and these sheds, hopefully. It's a lowland farm um, producing uh, store cattle. They finish the they finish the store cattle and they do a great deal or, or aren't at all reliant on purchasing feeds. What the animals consume uh, are pretty much all grown on farm. You can see various examples on screen there of the types of crops that the land cultivates for feeding his cattle. And obviously in turn, I mean, if he grows red clover, as we can see on the right hand side being mown, it means that the land uh, purchases less protein. So it probably makes financial sense for the land to do that. Uh, and certainly it makes an environmental sense in terms of carbon footprint, because in terms of uh, using red clover, you do need um, nitrogen and you don't need soya from South America because uh, red clover does give a lot of protein. So that's uh, an example of how Dylan has taken steps to reduce his carbon footprint. And there's other areas to, to to work on also. And then Eskar Gaur um, in Gwynedd, it's Emlyn Roberts's farm, uh, up to almost 3,000 feet above Seville. It's uh, a close flock of Welsh mountain ewes and Welsh black cattle. And he's participated in a number of agri-environment schemes going back years, to be honest, and has invested in a hydropower scheme. So ultimately, there are very different solutions uh, on Emily's farm to what you saw on Dylan's farm. Uh, it's exceptionally valuable, I feel, that this project does look at two focus sites that are very, very different uh, because the answers obviously will then be different in terms of what Emily can do and what Dylan can do, but both of you uh, can do something, certainly. And then the EIP Wales project, working with six farmers in the Brecon area. And to all ends and purposes, what these six farmers want to do 
is to see how they can get to the point of being carbon neutral. Uh, I, it's just what we've just talked about, this desire, this aspiration that we have. And again, we'll see where these guys will be at in terms of what needs to be done to be at net zero. Um, just a few days ago, uh, they were uh, doing some hedgerow management and you can see there uh, where they've been uh, addressing the hedges. Hedgerows take uh, the carbon in and they chip uh, some of the brush and so forth uh, that they've coppiced and they use it then uh, instead of purchasing straw, again, to reduce inputs. And uh, I know that I've just gone slightly over time, uh, but Liz will talk to you momentarily and she will talk to you about some other farms. It's vitally, vitally important. I don't think we can overemphasize how important this is because it's a challenge, uh, but there's a whole raft of advantages for doing this in terms of efficiency. Uh, and why wouldn't you want to be efficient if it means uh, that we can improve our business? Uh, and certainly it's something that is expected of the industry. And there's a picture of a horse there, horses for courses. The answers will be different for different farms. It can never be a one size fits all approach, uh, but certainly there are options open to every individual farm. And with those few words, I'll hand over to you, Gwaur. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prasar. Uh, a lot of very valuable information there. Uh, I'm sure that everyone had something that we can take out of that presentation and something uh, that would be food for thought for our own systems. We have two questions that have been submitted, and I figured that it's best that we address these before we move on to Liz. The question from Polly. This change depending where it is bought, for example, Wales, UK or Europe? Uh, I mean, can I go out the question? And the Q&A, in the chat. Yes. question of the Q&A, what is it? How, I think it's... How is the carbon how... for the feed concentrated? Okay. What, what this change depending where this is bought, are you Wales, UK, Europe? Uh, yes, Polly, it's a good, good question. Uh, and the answer is is yes. Um, it will change. It'll depend more on the on the uh, ingredients in the feed as opposed uh, as opposed to where the feed comes from. That is obviously important, but it's more to do with the ingredients in the feed. But if you're comparing barley with barley and barley grown in Wales or barley grown in in Europe, let's say, imported from France, then yes, obviously that will have an impact because uh, there'll be less emissions which, well, associated with transport. Anyway, there, there might be you know, other emissions that uh, are, um, may not be less if it's grown locally, but certainly you could be cutting out transport emissions. Uh, with regards to Chiretta and Aguar, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, carry on. Yeah. Thank you. With regards to chipping wood, is the carbon used when chipping calculated in the comparison against straw? Yes. Um, yes, it is. Good question, Scott. Uh, so we'll be looking at the fuel usage for uh, chipping the wood. And then um, obviously, it's sort of you win some, you lose some, really. You, there, there will be uh, fuel usage on the farm. But obviously, you know, if you think about where we buy, well, most of Wales, where we buy our straw from, it's Lincolnshire and well, maybe the Midlands. So, you know, there'll be less impacts associated with haulage and so on. So uh, no doubt there'll be a saving on, on fuel use, um, uh, uh, you know, taking all things into consideration. Yes, dear Professor. And one last question for Professor. In question all are, Professor. One other um, question for Professor. Greenhouse gases into account and nutrient density of meat. How does grass reared lamb and beef compare to intensively reared pork and poultry? Also, taking into account the arable cropping production to feed those pork and poultry. Yeah, well, really, really good point. Uh, if we can uh, use grass efficiently and reduce our reliance on bottom concentrates, then that can make a huge difference for sure. Um, uh, you know, growing grass for that then to potentially be wasted. You know, if, if we are growing grass through application of fertilizers from that grass to then grow and not to be used, and then we have to also buy in supplements to 
essentially provide the energy and the protein that the grass would have or should have provided the animals, then yes, it's a, it's a double hit, essentially. Um, so yeah, grassland utilisation is, is really important. And of course, you know, we can grow a lot of grass in Wales. Um, we've got the climate for it in, in general, not, not so much this spring, maybe, but uh, in general, we have the climate for growing grass and um, has to be one of our assets. I'm not, I'm not for a moment second saying that because it's grass fed, we're all okay. Uh, it's not as simple as that, unfortunately. Um, but uh, grass fed systems can have a lower impact. Great, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. So moving swiftly on, I would like to welcome tonight, um, tonight's second speaker, which is Liz Jennifer. Um, Liz works as, as an independent beef and sheep specialist. Um, and is currently working with Farming Connect um, on a few different projects. Um, so we'll, Liz will take you through um, some of the work that she has been doing um, with us um, on Carbon on some of our demonstration sites. So welcome, Liz. Um, and can I also just remind everybody, if you can, please um, still um, send your questions in through the Q&A box and we'll do our very best to answer them at the end. So over to you, Liz. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to really focus on um, where farmers have already gone to the step of carbon footprinting and then what are some ideas in terms of what to do with the numbers. So um, the plan is that I'm going to talk about some results from two farms I do some work with. So Reese and Russell and also Hugh Jones. So we're going to look at both of those farms, uh, their results from the carbon um, so the farm carbon toolkit. So both of them have used the same tool. And um, so Prisa, Prisa alluded to the importance of, of selecting the right tool and, and making sure if you're going to do any comparisons that you're comparing sim, um, the results from the same tool. I'm going to identify some hotspots, which will be very similar to quite a lot of beef and sheep farms. Um, and then looking at the activity that we're doing with those farms to try and address and to um, sort of make efficiencies wherever possible and trying to reduce the carbon that is being emitted really from these farms. And then sort of some thoughts that I have in terms of for those who are interested in sort of progressing carbon footprints themselves on their farms or had opportunities to do them, what do we need to think about before we start um, heading towards them? Um, so this is, these are the, um, these are sort of, start this again. These are the results from Hendry. Um, I'll take I'll talk you through them. So this is the summary of the results. And again, this tool is the farm carbon toolkit. So again, um, available um, to do. You can obviously there's a small charge to it, but again, you can enter your own data and submit it through this tool and get a result. So what they break it down to, and it's similar to what Presol was talking about, you've got an emissions bit. So that's the CO2, nitrous oxide and methane that's being emitted from your farming practices. And then you have an offset um, graph here, which is anything that is sucking carbon out of the atmosphere generally. And that's, as Priso talked about, that can be soil, it can be hedges, it can be woodland. Um, and then here you've got a carbon balance. So for this farm using this tool, they are more than net zero. So they are sequestering more carbon, storing more carbon in the soils or in the hedges or the woodland on that farm than they are emitting from the production of those at around 600 ewes on a hill, hill farm um, and taking those lambs through to finish. So that sort of, it just gives you a breakdown of, so again, so the emissions are what you are contribu contributing or the farm is contributing. And then we're also interested in what that the farm is also capturing from the atmosphere. So again, this is a positive story from this particular farm that they are more than net zero. When we then break it down in terms of where do those emissions come from, and this pattern you'll see is very familiar on farm. So the big chunk of carbon emissions are generally coming from livestock, and that tends to be in the form of methane. So through the digestion process that ruminants have, they tend to, they produce a lot of methane as a byproduct of that digestion, and that is belched out throughout the day. And that is taken into consideration in these carbon footprints. And that's why we tend to have these higher graphs when we associate with beef and sheep on farm. Um, and where most of their carbon are being stored, I think it's about 95% of their carbon is being captured within their soil organic matter. So this farm has high organic matter levels, so 12% plus. 
um, its baseline, do you mean, sorry, its base soil is quite, there's a lot of peat. So do you mean it, it's high organic matter soils to start with and then through their farming practices, which is rotation and grazing, using some nitrogen, but um, to sort of push growth on, they're sort of helping to ensure that that organic matter is being protected and ideally being built. So the other thing just to mention here, we've, we've got a slight increase here and it's clear on the next slide. And that's actually because they're submitting organic matter and readings for their farm is that there's actually been a reduction in between years. And so we benefit generally because of the amount of carbon that's being stored in the soil. But if we're getting results and there's a slight reduction just because perhaps of how we've sampled it the previous time or this time is that we also recognize that, that we how we've managed that soil has also led to some emissions coming out of the soil. So yes, we've captured a lot and we're storing a lot, but we soil also has the potential to release it if, if there's a slight change in practice. So that's also worth making sure you're aware of. So the hotspots here, 50% of those emissions are coming from the ewes, so those animals, but in reality, we are on a sheep farm. So it is um, without them that we are no longer a sheep farm. 13% are coming from fertiliser. So I've mentioned again, reasonable levels of fertiliser being used, not excessive, appropriate for the type of system they're running and the stocking rate they're trying to get to. Um, so there is some possible reductions there, but I, I don't think that's necessarily going to be zero. There's some options that we can look at in terms of clover, and I'll talk about that in a bit. We've got a reasonable chunk from lamb finishing, but again, that's a core part of this business, taking those animals through to... Uh, to um, deadweight sales. Um, I mentioned this uh, reduction in organic matter, and that's due to change in practice or, or sampling error in, in the when we've looked at those fields, and about 4% from feed. So this farm is using a total mixed ration approach to when those sheep are housed. Um, so actually trying to minimise the brought in feed and maximise the amount of forages that can be fed to satisfy that uh, pre uh, lambing diet. So where are we going to look for? So where are some ideas of sort of trying to reduce carbon? Um, the opportunities to increase sort of soil carbon and, and the soil capture is, is, is still there, but could we look at other sources on that farm too? So the key thing always when we're looking at these sort of systems is your efficiency. So the average weight on this farm is looking at about 65 kilos when we take it at, at topping. So that's generally the highest weight of the year, they're in, they're in peak perform peak level really at that point. So that's sort of a fair representation. And our target for ewe efficiency, and that's sort of the proportion of weight that that animal is weaning as a flock measure, is over 65% in most um, ewe flocks. So an example would be if if you're rearing 1.65 and averaging about 26 kilos at weaning, and that's around about 90 days, 12, 13 weeks that's where you're going to get that U efficiency of about 65% if you've got what use around that weight. So what we tend to have is if, you're, if your system relies on bigger sheep, we generally want more lambs and we want those lambs to be bigger. But the trade-off is always, are you using creep to achieve those weights? So it's about this sort of the fine balance between making sure those ewes are efficient um, but we're not necessarily increasing the amount of inputs going into those farms. The other thing we're looking for is post weaning growth rate. So um, as a lot of sheep farms do, occasionally struggles with post weaning performance, particularly um, into the autumn combination of factors. Can, so is it something to do with grass quality or grass availability? Is there an element of trace element also um, kicking in? So we are looking at the marketing pattern and the key thing with emissions is that every it's really driven by feed intake. So the more days on farm, the more dry matter they're eating, the more likely they are to be producing more levels of methane. So the importance of removing unproductive stock and also trying to reduce days to slaughter. Um, this farm is part of Ram Compare and are accessing really good genetics. And also because of their record keeping, are able to identify the best breeds to that are performing on their mainly grass-based system. And we've also um, working with their vet to look at the trace elements and also a mild lameness problem that affected some of those lambs last autumn time. So again, it's that combination of looking at grass availability, grass quality, and also considering health and welfare. 
as well to try and maximize that the performance of those animals. Um, other areas to look at, and again, it's applicable for a lot of farms, is this use of clover. So rather than um, put, put, like using nitrogen fertilizer, what we have to remember is nitrogen, nitrous oxide is still released from soils, even though they're being fertilized by clover. Um, but what we're doing by focusing on clover is we're actually reducing the energy cost it takes to produce that nitrogen fertilizer and transport it and spread it and all of those factors um, alongside that. So there's also on this farm, they're using chicken muck as an alternative source of P and K and also nitrogen. So again, reducing that reliance on bought in um, nitrogen fertilizer. The grazing system, do you mean in terms of rotational grazing and management of sword height will in time encourage that clover to come in. Some of the challenges here are lower pHs than, than ideal, but it links back to those high organic matter soils, partly because of the peat um, that's in that area. So sometimes that doesn't always work well with trying to maximise clover levels at certain times of year. Um, there's also an element about fuel use, and we've got to be realistic about how much we can reduce that by. That's generally affected by the farm layout. Um, so if you're having to travel distances to look at stock, uh, they've recently invested in a slatted floor system for one of their main sheep housing systems. So that is I mean, it's reducing machinery of moving straw, uh, removing, the, um, reducing the sort of energy cost of transporting that straw onto the farm. So again, all of these things are sort of small marginal gains that are all helping to reduce that number further. And we do have to point out alongside all of this is, yes, we're doing a huge amount to capture soil carbon, but is there opportunities to put hedges or additional trees onto those farms to try and improve that amount of sequestration? even though it's quite high already. Um, so moving on to Bryn Farm. Um, so this is um, Hugh Jones, around about 80 suckler cows and heifers, a spring carving system. Also um, has an area of arable, um, of which feeds some of that grain back into finishing bulls, and also the straw goes into that system. Real high dependency or very um, efficient at rotationally grazing both cows and calves and also starting to rotationally graze growing cattle too. So again, we can see the same principle to what, uh, same sort of structure of what we've looked at from the first farm. So emissions in the blue, offset in the green, um, and the carbon balance. So again, this farm is, is more than net zero, um, not quite as uh, net, no, not quite as, uh, it's sequestering slightly less than the than Reese and Russell, but still um, below that zero mark. Again, when we break it down um, on this farm, like most farms with beef and sheep, the main source of emissions are coming out of livestock. So that's the methane that is being produced through digestion. Um, and this farm is also benefiting from having high levels of carbon capture through in the soil. And that's partly through his practices of rotational grazing, but also he's been min till no tilling his land for probably at least 10 years. So that again has helped in terms of building that organic matter soils, um, sorry, organic matter in its soils. Um, so there's, in terms of the hotspots on Bryn Farm, so as, again, similar story to what we saw on the first one. So 43% of those emissions are coming from the cows, about 12% coming from the fertilizer, in this case, ammonium nitrate. Uh, a chunk from the finishing cattle, which is probably like to in increase as has a system of moving more towards selling fewer stores and retaining and growing those animals on and finishing them on farm. There's also a proportion allocated towards the solar equipment, and that's to do with its manufacturing. But obviously it, it is has some offset in terms of reducing electricity use on farm and then a 5% from fuel. So we can sort of start to find these hotspots, but we can quite clearly see on, on most of these livestock farms, we've got to be targeting the efficiency of these animals. The challenge we've got for Bryn and very similar for Reese and Russell as well is actually they're doing a very good job already on, anim on the animal performance. So it is small tweaks that we can, we can look at to see what else we can do. So this farm average cow weight is 550. So for the vast majority of farms, it's significantly lower than most cow weights would be. We might be getting 650, um, heading towards 700 kilos. We also start to look at cow efficiency, this idea of actually what proportion of their live weight are they able to wean a year. 
Um, cows struggle to do sort of more than 45% at a herd level. And so an example would be if you're rearing um, 0.94 calves and so 94 calves per 100 females put to the bull, and they're about 260 kilos at weaning. And again, that's that's working on about a kilo a day growth rate. So again, it's high performing herds that are sort of able to achieve that cow efficiency. Uh, again, on this farm, we have we have implemented some strategic use of creep feed. Yes, there is emissions associated with those with that feed coming in. But because of the system involving finishing bulls, it just uh, that and the efficiency of those young animals converting that feed into growth, it fits that system. So strategic use of, gen, of trying to split up um, cow groups into male calves and female calves allows us to target that creep quite specifically to those animals that are going to go into a, into a bull finishing enterprise. There's an, an opportunity to monitor fuel use and also nitrogen use. But again, back to what we've just looked on. The, the big ticket items on these farms are the animals and, and trying to improve the efficiency, ensure that anything that isn't productive is, is off that farm as, as quickly as possible. We've sort of, I've sort of mentioned the, the sort of shift in strategy for this farm. So um, the, there's a use of herbal aids. So this, the farm is on quite light land, quite a lot of sandy land. So it can in the summer be very dry and, and not necessarily that robust for grass growth so Hughes invested in some herbal lays to try and improve that growth rate of those of these growing cattle during the year we had some issues this year with performance in that very wet autumn so they've gone out slightly lighter than we wanted but we've got this sort of monitoring plan to make sure they're aiming to finish most of them um, by the autumn um, well hopefully a bit early but certainly not going to take them through a full winter so again, we're monitoring live rate performance of those animals, understanding whether that herbal lay is adding value from a stock performance perspective, but also what it's doing in terms of soil quality. So, Jean, I thought they're just really, some really nice examples of farms that are doing, the, doing highly efficient from a technical perspective. There's small tweaks to be made as there is on every farm, again, and, but it is very achievable to get to that net zero. But it is about that balance between technical efficiency and soil management, grazing management, to make sure that we're really optimising that sequestration, the soil carbon storage, really. So the, my sort of top tips for when people are thinking about carbon footprinting, um, we've sort of alluded to it quite a few times. And there's actually an NSA, so National Sheep Association webinar on the 2nd of June, looking at tools for carbon footprinting too so if you're interested it's worth having a look at that as well so what we have to think about is what is in and what is out so the carbon farm toolkit that we were we've just been looking at looks at the whole farm so it captures things if you're if you've got some solar panels if you've got um some sort of hydro schemes it captures all of that within that whole farm model some of the tools just look at an enterprise level so we've just got to really understand what what is it looking at? What bit of the farm are you interested in looking at? Um, and back to that point that just be really careful in terms of trying to make comparisons between tools because the, the way they collect the data can be slightly different. What are the units? So we've looked at sort of total farm output, but it could be per hectare, it could be kilos of live weight sold. So again, it's um, dependent on what question you're trying to answer. So are you doing a comparison between your beef and your sheep enterprises? Then kilos of live weight sold may be applicable. If you're doing, um, if you're wanting to think about how you're using your land area per hectare might be appropriate. So it depends on what you're really trying to answer with that carbon footprint. Um, I've mentioned this several times, but in terms of just be really careful about tool comparisons. Um, and what both of these have done, of, of particularly Bryn, had, did, um, sorry, Hugh at Bryn Farm, he it was part of a group. So he, he was one of a sort of a discussion group that did them. And so there was some comparison value within that group. So it's back to any of this, which is lovely to have a piece of paper or a, or a website with those results on, but actually the bit that I'm interested in is what are we gonna do next? So where can we set targets? What are the, I mean, we can talk about KPIs if we want, but it's what are you gonna do with the numbers? And this is really similar to a financial or technical breakdown. Do you mean if, if we went through the various systems that are available to do financial sort of cost of production, 
It will help us identify areas of our business that we have to improve. It won't tell us how. So it's it's the the next steps on from what we've identified as those hotspots, which is important. And it there is a clear, clear link between carbon efficiency and profitability. So the fewer inputs that we have to bring on farm, generally that's we're moving towards more profitable systems, but that is obviously tailored towards animal. Just we have to check that tech performance is good enough too. So and if we if we can think about how do we reduce the carbon and in sort of reduce our carbon footprint, it is generally linked to improving profitability on those farms. Um, the other thing that we have to be careful of that is this probably in the next six months to a year maybe, is that we're really focusing on carbon, but actually the retailers are starting to go, well, that's lovely, but actually what about plastics or what about biodiversity? What about actually what is your social impact of your farm? How are you managing your staff? How are you doing all of those bits? to actually improve the sort of true sustainability of your farm. So carbon is only one section. So the bit I'm trying to encourage is people, we can, we can get a little bit obsessive about carbon and trying to drill that really far down, but actually we have to think of the other elements as well um, into, from what retailers and processors may be asking for in the next six months to a year probably. And certainly biodiversity monitoring is, is raising itself up on that list. The how is a different question, but it, there's a lot of interest in it. That's me done. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, I am conscious that we are coming to a close, but we do have two questions um, for you, Liz. Um, I think, the, well, sorry, there's one for Prasar, I think, and then one for Liz. Um, so I'll ask the one for Liz first. So do you believe that with good practice, we can continue to annually build soil organic matter or will we get to a point where no more can be added? So what the what we tend to think is there's soils get to an equilibrium, so they don't build any more organic matter in them. Um, and particularly, we're more likely to be getting towards that equilibrium on grassland, long-term grassland soils than we would be in an arable type situation. So I think the big focus really on those longer term grasslands is actually protecting the carbon that's already stored in those soils. So, and you notice I, I, I use both phrases because I think we can keep chasing this build and build and build and keep increasing that number, but actually we've got to protect what we've got there. So it is about thinking about minimal cultivations if we're needing to reseed. It's thinking about how can we manage that structure to so we really um, in, in sort of maintain the integrity of that soil but certainly we'll, we will reach an equilibrium a change in practice may up, may increase it it may reduce it so for example if we started to use a lot of organic materials again it might increase for a bit and then it will find its new level and the other thing is to think about is that that carbon is playing an important role within from a soil biology perspective because it's feeding them so the healthier your soils become the more hungry they become so um, it's yes, we need to feed them, but that's part of the is that as the soils get healthier, the population that we we've, we've built also gets hungrier. So it is it becomes more challenging to keep building and building and building. Great, thank you very much, Liz. Um, one other question for Prusor: um, Coppice hetero will regrow and continue to, to sequester carbon both above and below ground. Yes, uh, that is an important point. Uh, if we can use the, uh, well, managing hedgerows is, is a really important, uh, well, potentially very important part of helping us to reduce uh, the net emissions from farms. And you know what we often see, in, unfortunately, is hedgerows that are flailed almost to within an inch of their life, really. Um, and, you know, those hedgerows will be growing during the year and then they are flailed very very heavily and then you know there is a loss of um, of carbon essentially some will be returned to the ground but if we can let our hedgerows grow a bit taller and a bit wider then um that could be important you know could play a, an important part uh, the jigsaw and then the point about the coppicing yeah so it's again it's about improving the management and the, the biomass of, of hedgerows that we have 
Yes, dear Professor. Um, and one final question for this evening um, to either Liz or Professor. Um, how far off a full carbon trading market do you think we are? I know at the moment there is no set industry standard or accreditation um, so hard to trade offsets, etc. So how far off are we from a full carbon trading market in your opinion? I it's, well, it's definitely starting and there's and there's people within the arable sector that it's a bit easier to predict in terms of what those soils are going to do, they would argue, in the arable. But I think there isn't, it is more challenging with grassland because, of, as we said, it can go up and down. These fluxes um, can happen quite easily. So you've been paid one year to, to benefit because you've stored or captured more carbon and the next year something's changed and you've released more. So I do, th we, there is a bit about how we measure definitely um but i think it's going to be coming and the challenge is it's going to be coming from commercial companies who don't necessarily respect the sciencey bit and they want to be first into that market that is going to be potentially lucrative um and i know a lot of land agents as subsidy reduces think that carbon trading will replace some of that so i think it will be coming soon but i'm not sure we can answer all the questions that it will generate just, just briefly on the back of that, well, um, I completely agree with what Liz has just said, but if you've got peat, if you're on peatland, then uh, it's well worth checking the peatland carbon code because you can get payments for storing carbon in peatland. Um, it's an option worth looking at for sure. And if you've got woodland, then there is the woodland carbon code. And that is also an opportunity for you to... Uh, to get paid to sell the carbon that you're sequestering. So the Woodland Carbon Code and the Peatland Code are well worth having a look at. Brilliant. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, just a few things just to finish off then. Um, I would just like to remind you um, that we do have another webinar on carbon coming up on, on the 27th of May at 7 o'clock. Um, so this uh, particular webinar will be looking more um, at carbon accounting methods and incorporating specific areas which will contribute to the equation in calculating the carbon footprint of the farm and also um, its potential value in terms of carbon units and public goods. So if you would like to register your interest for that particular webinar, please visit the Farming Connect website or you're more than welcome to email gerainds.jones at minterbusiness.co.uk and you will need to do that before three o'clock on the 27th of May um, in order to receive a link for that particular webinar. Um, also, just to let you know, as Prisa mentioned earlier on um, the, during his presentation, um, Family Connect does have a range of different services which are specifically um, able to help you in terms of carbon and also reducing emissions and so on on your farms. So if you've not received it already, um, there should be um, a Let's Get Greener booklet on its way out to in the post. Um, if you haven't received it um, yet, uh, this booklet is also available on the Farming Connect website. So it just includes um, some information on reducing emissions, um, some really useful technical articles and so on, and then also a comprehensive list of the different services that we have available um, which can help you in terms of, of carbon footprinting um, and reducing emissions on your farm. So um, do make full use of, of that um, resource um, on the Farming Connect website um, as well. Um, so just to finish off, thank you very much to our speakers this evening. So Professor and Liz, thank you very much for your time and all the information um, that you presented this evening. Also, thank you very much to our, to our translator, Hevin, um, for joining us um, and doing a cracking job as normal. Um, and also, thank you very much to all of, of, of you, our audience as well, um, for joining us tonight and for your questions um, and so on. Um, just to let you know as well, when you will be leaving the webinar, uh, you will be asked, um, you will be directed to a feedback um, or an evaluation form. Um, it would be really useful if you can, please spare just two minutes to fill that in quickly, um, just so that we can get a better grasp really of the type of events, events that you'd like to, to see us holding in future um, and also provide feedback um, on the webinar tonight and how we can improve for future webinars. So thank you very much, everybody, and good night.